person. So do you want me to introduce you as, is it Christine or Kristen? Christine, of the same horn. Okay. Yeah. I have to ask, because you know, so many people, they pronounce their names so many different oh, ways. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Hey guys, it's Bree Sobers here with Impact Atlanta Magazine, and as promised to you, I am here with Christine Horn. Ooh, hello. Isn't she beautiful? I told you guys, she was gonna be beautiful, right? Y'all didn't believe me, now you believe me, right? Look, look how gorgeous she is. Oh, come on, Bree, stop. I mean, stop. <laughs> she is gorgeous. I had the opportunity of, um, chopping it up with her before this interview started and we're getting ready to jump into it um and i just really love her spirit and her personality and so um we're gonna get this interview started for you guys and really have some really great conversations i know from just speaking with her the jewels that she's about to drop so hopefully some of you viewers at home have your pen and pad ready yes. and you can take some of these notes that she's going to give out especially if you're looking to get into this business on how you two can become successful okay so let's get into it christine yes. how are you today i'm amazing i'm so happy to meet you you too yes i had a i mean speaking to you over the phone was one thing but meeting you in person is another you're extremely beautiful thank you love it I, i'm a chocolate baby so i always love seeing right. other chocolate babies right <laughs> um but your spirit i was just speaking of your spirit and when you were telling me right from you're so warm, so inviting, you know. Um, where does that come from? Thank you for that, first of all. You know, I think it just comes from being loved, come from a loving family. You know, they say hurt people hurt people, but I believe like loving people love people love people. But hard, I get it, right? I get it. You know, my mom was my mom, shout out to my mother Valerie, single mom, raised me just to be courageous, to be loving. Um, to be kind, you know, and considerate. And so I guess that's just what that is. That that just that Caribbean love that just passes through our veins. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I um my writing partner, Mr. Dewey. Miss, you know, come on, Mr. Dewey. <laughs> Mr. Can't tell Mr. Dewey nothing, but he always says where you gotta love your people. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we really did enough of that, it would truly help us to um, get back to the essence of us and you know, who we are and our greatness. Um, and especially with our culture, our black culture is so beautiful. So many other cultures mimic it um, yeah. and appreciate and value it, but us. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the way we love ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, we love each other. Um, yeah. So that's a very, very strong and valid point that you just made there. Um, they call you the booking magnet. Yes. Let's talk about that. I'm, I'm trying to be the booking man. And first of all, let me rub up on the blessings of Abraham. <laughs> Listen, for real, you guys, you got to rub up. When you see somebody that's blessed, don't hate. Mm -hmm. Rub up on that blessing. That's proximity. It, proximity is power. Yes, it, 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 it will. It will spread over. So, yeah. <laughs> get some of that. So, Explain that. Why do they call you the booking magnet? Well, they call me the booking magnet because I began calling myself that first. I believe you got to speak life into yourself. I'm a huge, huge believer in affirmations and mantras and speaking life into yourself. And I'm a big student of the law of attraction. There was a point in my life where things weren't going so great, you know, in between jobs and career hurdles, ebbs and flows. I was like, I really dove deep into personal development. And one of the things I studied was like universal laws, law of attraction. And I was like, wait, okay, you're telling me I can attract people. I, no, not I, I can, I am attracting people to my life. People, experiences, money, all these things. I was like, well, if I can do that, I can attract bookings. Well, I'm a, I'm a booking magnet. If we're all magnets, all attracting things to us, well, then I'm a booking magnet. I'm calling for the bookings, I attract bookings. So I, one day, it was like 2017, I just started calling myself the booking magnet. I would look in the mirror, say, I am a booking magnet. I am a booking magnet. I am a booking magnet. But then I would go online and do videos and do uh, uh, Facebook Lives and Instagram Lives. And I'd be like, what's up? It's Christine Horn, the booking magnet. I am a booking magnet. And people just started 
I taught people how to say that to me. Oh wow. So now sometimes people will see me in the street, don't even know my name. Ain't you the uh the cooking magnet? That's right, right. And anybody who works with me, I mentor a lot of actors too. And I I speak lightly to them. And I'm like, you you are a cooking magnet. So we're all calling me, imagine just this this effect of hundreds of actors around the world calling themselves booking magnets and we're all just attracting this. And so that's how it got started. And this has become a whole thing. So okay. you are a booking magnet. Touch me again. Touch me again. Touch me again. All right? So yes. Yeah, that's yes. How started. I that. So you believe in the law of attraction? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's happening whether you believe in it or not, right? You know, when you look at your circumstances, look at your life, you look at the circle around you, the people who are in your life are direct reflections of what you're putting out. You are attracting everything into your life, whether you believe it or not. So once I really understood that, I was like, huh, well, if I can have some control around this, let me be more intentional about who I surround myself with. Right. The people. And let me be clear, like we talked about vision boards before we hit record, right? So what am I envisioning for my life? Because when you make a vision board, you know you are putting out a, that's, you're calling forth what you desire to come into your life. Absolutely. So it's, absolutely, I'm a huge student of it and I'm just, I've seen it happen in my life. Manifestations after manifestations that started up here before it even became a physical thing that started up here. I, I think that people don't understand that the same way, and it works the same way with negative thoughts. Oh, um, yeah. If you keep manifesting ne negative thoughts in your mind, those things start to play out in your life. So if it happens to us with negative thoughts, sometimes on a daily a daily basis, you know, you stump your toe, your day is kind of like ruined for the day. Somebody tells you something you don't want to hear, you have an attitude kind of ruins your day. But, you know, the day your kids did something to you, get upset, um, it kind of ruins your day for the day, right? But that same thought process, it spills over into other things, and that's what makes your day so hard, right. you know? Um, but it also happens when you have positive thoughts. When you wake up and you're happy and you feel beautiful, or someone tells you you look at them, you smell amazing, you know, anything, you eat a good meal, um, your dog comes and plays with you, you get all these positive, bubbly thoughts, right? And so now you have, you feel like, I'm having a great, I'm having an amazing day. So it works two folds. Um, the better you know, it gets, the better it gets. Right, but you also, with that being said, you have the ability to change your day. Yeah, I always say it's like a light switch. You're on or off, you're positive or negative. Everything is energy. And once you really understand that, without going deep into quantum physics, once you really understand that everything is energy, we are all energy, and look, we're human. We may have, something may happen. You got stuck in traffic, right? You got a car flat. You could easily like, oh, what's... Girl, I ain't letting nothing right? disturb my peace. I used but, to be there. but that's <laughs> I used to growth. Be there. That's that oh, growth. Oh my god! Because at any time you can catch yourself doing that, but then it's like, okay, I'm a light switch. Okay, this happened, but am I on or off? Am I positive or negative? And at any point, you can catch yourself and be like, oop, I choose to be positive again, right. and I'm gonna put more positive. Yes, yeah, something maybe bad happened in the moment, but that does not have to affect the rest of my day or the rest of my life. Right. Stuff is gonna happen to us. So right. yeah. I, and I'm, like I said, I've been there, you know, and I've just learned not to let things disturb my peace mm -hmm. so much. Because what you people don't realize, it starts to affect you mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, it affects your immune system when you allow things to just truly disturb you. So I've learned my lesson with that. And I can tell you, I'll be like, look, it's... It's gonna be what it's gonna be because it is what it right. is. <laughs> you know, yeah. so and I, I hate to be like that sometimes, but and it's I know it drive people crazy, but you can't you can't change what you can't change. So it's gonna be what it's gonna be. Yeah. It's such a true statement. So so being with that, you're also a teacher, right? This industry and the way sometimes it's set up, especially for black actors in the business, trying to make a name for themselves. Um, and all, sometimes they probably feel like, hey, I, I went out there and did my best. I really, really tried hard. I felt like I outperformed everybody in that audition, but it wasn't me. How do you teach them to do that? Oh, oh, that's a great question. You know, I, I'm always teaching 
I teach everybody I mentor, and I mentor actors from 18 to 75, you know, everything in between. And I always remind them, like, our job is not, the one job is not about booking the role, because only one person can get the role for that job. That does not mean that the rest of us sucked. <laughs> Right. right? Some of y'all did suck. Some of y'all do need work. Right? right? But the, that doesn't mean all of us do. It just means you just, that was not yours. And so I remind my, everyone I mentor that your job is to what I call book the room, which means that casting director, that, that those producers, that studio, they're going to do other things. And they're going to remember you. So your one job is to make yourself memorable in the best possible way. And so look, you have to understand that what's for you can't miss you. Look, I'm on a show called Snowfall. It hits show on FX. I audition, well, people don't know, I audition for Snowfall every season from its inception. Even season four, when I finally booked it as Black Diamond, earlier that season, I auditioned for three other roles that season. And the casting director actually commented on my Instagram post after we had a premiere, and she said, right role, right time. She said, it was your heart, your passion for the craft that we that kept calling that we kept calling you back in. She said, we just opened the door. You did the hard work of showing up. And so I say that to anybody who's listening or watching, like, or reading this, right, is that your job is to do the work. Your job is to be exceptional. Your job is to be memorable characters. Your job is to tell a story. And only one person can book it, but you can't then take not booking it as something that's wrong with you. You can't let that affect your self-worth. And I think that's why so many people don't make it and stick with this. This career is hard. This career is not for the faint of heart. If you can't deal with rejection daily, daily, <laughs> you need to go, right? I know you see glitz, glamour, red carpets, but what you don't see is that or hear are all the stories and all the notes of those same actors got. You know, you're watching the yes that came through, but it was a whole lot of no's. So if you are focused on the fun, if you're focused on telling the story, and you're focused on being excellent, being the best Christine, the best breed you can, then that's what matters. Right, absolutely. I always say that rejection is God's protection and redirection. You will never miss what God has in store for you. Um, but you were speaking, and I was going to get to that snowfall. I love snowfall. <laughs> and I love your I was character. a fan too. I was a fan before I got, even booked the show. Trust me. I love your character, Black Dog. She was throwing people in the trunk. I mean. Hitting people in the head. So you got a little gas <laughs> huh? You know, just a little that Bronx, that Bronx coming out. That B. I was just getting ready to say she's a BX problem. Okay, so so how did growing up in the Bronx help you with that role of black, or did it help you at all? Well, that? I will say this: growing up in the Bronx, because my mom has three kids. My mom and dad divorced when I was one, and I was the only child for 14 years. Mm -hmm. So my brother and sister grew up in the South. They grew up in Atlanta, and I feel like they grew up very, very privileged. I mean, I was privileged too, but I grew up in the Bronx. Like, in the, what the Bronx taught me was independence. Okay. My mother, you know, I was a latchkey kid. My mother had to go to work, so she had to give me the key so I could get home after school. I had to take care of myself so she got home. You know, I got conned by some con artists when I was 12 years old. Oh, wow. Like, it's life lessons that the hard New York streets will teach you that does something to you. Like, I had a great childhood, but there were some moments where I was like, ooh, lesson, <laughs> lesson, and it hardened, some pieces hardened me. And I definitely am more independent. I'm very aware, I'm hyper aware, and I, I'm sus suspect of a lot of people because growing up in the Bronx, like, like you know, being a kid, you gotta, you taught to look out and to, to not trust, don't, you can't just trust everybody. So I think I got to bring some of that into Black Diamond in the, to the matter of she, she and her cohort, Dallas, you know, we don't trust, we trust each other to a fault, to a point, I'm sure. But we're, we have no loyalty to anybody because right. we know this is, this is, we know what game this is, this is a drug game. Right. And, and we have kids and we got responsibilities and we don't, we don't got, there's no emotional detach, detachment here. It's who's paying more. Right. We'll do the job because we get the job done, which I love about Black Diamond because she's, 
she's she's a boss in her own right. The ta- you know, Taylor Polidor who plays Dallas is like the, the fire starter. She's just mm-hmm. quick and I'm like, I'm more of the brain. Like, but no, let's think this Diamond way. wanted to get paid regardless. <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not she brought back the right person was irrelevant Give to the point. Give me a little something. I mean, I, I did some work. It was irrelevant to the point that I just hit this dude in the head. I don't care if he's the wrong person or not. You gotta pay me. I was like... We got babysitters for this. How you you bring back the wrong product and and still want to get paid? Like, he paid for a Pacific customer. Oh, Oh, gosh. When you say it like that, it's it's a hot mess. Think about it. That's what Dallas did. She was just like... A funny funny story that a lot of people don't know is originally, we both auditioned for the opposite role. So Taylor auditioned for Black Diamond, I auditioned for Dallas. And then when they saw the tape and they were narrowing it down to who they were going to put together, at the last minute they were like, can you both tape for the opposite role? And then we did and then we both looked it. So it's been a that time. was meant for you. Like, yeah. yes, that's that's what God had intended for you. I just think that it, it, it's so funny that you say that because Dallas, she was no joke in there. She was like, you're going to pay me. Yeah. You're going to give me something. <laughs> so you grew up here in the South. I moved, yeah, I moved to Atlanta in 1992. Did you grow up in Atlanta? Yeah. You in both College Park. Which... Okay, because, you know, oh, Miranda got this new song out. And I, I've been, I've been <laughs> hearing so, about. I have not heard I it yet. I love that song. I got I gotta listen to it. But yeah, you know, when we moved, from, when we left New York. My mother, she wanted a better life for us. My brother was one at the time, and my sister was on the way. And she was like, I'm. She, my mom was a legal secretary for in New York for, you know, most of her adult life. And she just wanted. She saved her money. She's like, I'm gonna give my kids a better life. And I was pissed. I mean, in New York, we didn't call it Georgia or South Carolina. It was just. The South. It's just a blanket South area. Right. And I move into the South, but it was in hindsight, it was the best thing that could have ever happened because what my mother didn't tell me was the house she bought, she bought specifically in the district to one of the top performing arts performing arts high schools here in Atlanta, which is Tri Cities High School, okay. where Keenan Thompson went, where Candy Burris went, right? Okay. So, you know, my mother did her due diligence in picking it, and it, that school changed my life. And I was going to say, College Park has truly, you know, um, brought some really great talent out of there that has represented Georgia, has represented Atlanta, Absolutely. has just represented the whole state phenomenally. And you are another top talent that's coming out of College Park. So honored. I am, you know, as people in Lithonia. <laughs> We're going to have to watch out. <laughs> you know, I love Atlanta. Atlanta's just like, even though I'm from the Bronx, Bronx the Bronx is special to me because those are the years that formed me. But Atlanta is where I, like, came into myself. You grew up. You right. Grown. And I was a teenager. Like, so many things happened here. So Atlanta just holds a special place in my heart. I always I have this saying um, that I tell people about myself when they ask me to describe myself. I always tell them I'm Panama's baby, book and raised me, but ATL broke me. Yeah, you know, I like and that. yeah, and I mean because my family's from here in the south. Um, my family's been in the business forever. I have deep, deep, deep southern roots that can be traced back to slaves. We have school buildings, we have churches. So I just feel like I'm so blessed to even be able to say, hey, this is where I'm from. This is who my family is, you know. Um, Atlanta has a way of just grooming you and making you softer, making you get more in contact. Well, Georgia, I should say, have a way of making you more in contact with that feminine energy um, that you need as a woman to be successful. You know, I I had um, Southern Belle. Well, grandma, my grandmother had the big uh, magnolia flower in her hair. She was so beautiful, you know? Yeah. And they just have a way of just bathing and just yeah. bringing you, horny you in. And um, do you ever feel like you bring any of that into your character, those southern roots, that feminine energy that you I do. room here with? I do. And I think not so much for snowfall, but when I, I play a lot of doctors and um, doctors, moms, therapists, and I, that is definitely an area where I bring that in. And I even bring that in in the work that I do as I mentor actors because a lot of it is life coaching. 
And you know, that's something that I've, I've, I've always done outside of acting on the screen is helping other people achieve their goals. Um, and so yeah, it comes very natural to me. But I love when I get roles for therapists especially ther ther any therapist counselor because and, and doctors you know I've gone to auditions where the casting director is just they just get stuck watching me I'm like I want you to be can you be my doctor in real life you have such a nice bedside manner you're so relaxed and I'm like because I, I think about how would I want to be cared for and how We've all, like, you know, most of us, either ourselves or a loved one, have been in a hospital at some point or had to get something done and dealt with a nurse or a doctor who was a little rough or just didn't seem warm. And I'm always like, I want to be the person who's warm, who makes you feel good about, who takes some of that stress away, that anxiety away. You know, I know I have a warm, I can give a warm energy, so I lean into that. But absolutely, that. That's all used in my roles for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your yeah. upbringing most definitely helps you to play out things when you're acting and, and just trying to get through that process. Even in life, I find, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really does. Like you said, growing up in the Bronx, it really helps you to kind of like scan the room and see where the exit is. Yeah. Number one, and then, and then and then on top of that, <laughs> I married a uh, you know a marine. You know, and I'm married into a military family, you yes. know, Air Force and more Marines and, you know, Navy. So no they, oh, that's all they teach me. It's like, where, where's it? So now I'm extra, you know. So, yeah. so when I do play military roles, I've, I've been blessed to play some, some of those, which are fun. You know, I have, oftentimes they think I've served. And I have, I'm like, I haven't. I just am around people who have, and I've just listened to their stories and watched how they operate right. and I emulate that. Right. You know, so. And and that's funny you say that because I come from a military family as well. My dad was a ranger. My brother uh, was a ranger. I believe he think he's made it all the way to the special forces. Oh, wow. My other brother was Gary. He was a marine. So uncles, cousins, you name it, I, they they've been all over the military. Mm -hmm. You know, my uncle in the army. You walk in, you see his name out there. You know, so it's. It's, it's a very no nonsense yeah. <laughs> atmosphere. You straight to the point. Yeah. Um, you say what you mean and you mean what you say. Do I respect you, that. Do you, do you find yourself in this industry having to be that way at times? You know? you, yes, and having to advocate for myself. Yeah, because this industry, if you're not careful, there's enough people always telling you what's what's right, what's not right, or what you need to fix about yourself. And even when you book when you book gigs and you get opportunities sometimes, it, people people try you. I mean let's be real. People will try you. People will try to undervalue you, underpay you, uh, talk to you any kind of way. And it's up to you to stand up for yourself and advocate for yourself. And right. and that may come with, you know, as a woman, you know, being called a B or, you know, like aggressive but whatever. So I'm gonna it is. But you know, it's the it's the nature of the beast and you gotta know how to operate within this realm. Right. With professionalism, but but uh, tact and uh, like this is what I need. Yeah. So let's jump into your role on the Lion King the stage play. Oh, yeah. How is that? Oh, amazing. Life changing. And I booked, I was working my nine to five here in Atlanta. Um, and I went to an open call at the, at the actually at the Clark Atlanta University campus. Okay. It was a dual open call for two shows. One was The Lion King and the other was a show that's now not, it's not on Broadway anymore, but it was called Aida. And they did a dual open call for everybody in Atlanta. And I went, I did audition for both. Never heard anything from The Lion King. Aida had multiple callbacks and even an offer that I turned down. So, okay. Three years later, I was still working at my day job and I got a call from my agent saying, Christine, The Lion King wants you to come to New York for a callback this oh, week. Oh, wow. Three years Three later. Three years. Wow. I'm like, so I scramble but borrow money to get to New York because <laughs> it was in New York. I go, I don't book it. They told my agent, oh, she was next in line if something comes up. A month after that, they called my agent and said, you can't foresee me on tour in, a month, in, the, ne in, this, in the next week. Oh, wow. Quit the job, honey, put things in storage. 
That was 2006, and I did The Lion King on, on and off for five years. I did both national tours. The Broadway, I joined the Broadway company in 2008, which was a dream come true. I did the Mandalay Bay uh, company in Las Vegas before they closed. Even got to go to Germany and explore that show and learn the show in German. It was an amazing ride, life-changing friendships that I that I still have to this day. And just being able to see most of the United States who performed in Honolulu for three months, wow. Mexico City. I mean, I mean, it was just amazing. epic. Amazing. Um, just wonderful. Amazing. Yeah. My um, cousin, I think I shared this with you, is Renai. He played Mufasa okay. um, in The Lion King in New York on Broadway. And he played it for a while up there. So I'm, I'm surprised that you guys haven't ran into each other. But we, I, may ha we may have. I believe know. it's just a matter of time. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have the Lion King is kind of like its own fraternity sorority in a way. Mm -hmm. like, like, the family is so huge. Like, we even have Facebook groups for different companies that were used to be on tour. But yeah, it's huge. It's almost like a rite of passage for a lot of black artists. <laughs> so can we jump into, because we're talking about theater, mm -hmm. that transition from theater into film. Mm -hmm. What was that like? It wasn't hard? It wasn't easy for you? It was definitely challenging. Okay. Um, because, and I'm sure many people can relate to this who have done both, it's a different medium. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can act. Yes, you have talent. But there are two different mediums. One is performing to a 1,200 seat or more theater audience, right? So everything is big, bold, and you're used to like being extra so that the person in the nosebleeds can see what you're doing. Versus the lens that is that reads your mind. So I had a very big, hard adjustment because I actually left the Mandalay Bay Vegas company the night it closed, December 31st. I drove to LA, ready to take Hollywood by storm, and I wasn't working. And the note I would get from directors and producers when I did get auditions was, Christine, you're just, it's just too big. You gotta tone it down. And I didn't understand what that meant. You know, like, I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> but it took, I had to get coaching and I had to start. That's when I started studying television. I started studying movies. What were they doing that was so different than what I was doing on stage? And I understood that, oh, and this is what no one just taught you in school. Like I didn't go to, I didn't, I don't have a college degree, but I always like to be very transparent about that. I learned in the streets, I learned in the process. And what people don't teach is that the camera is a lie detector and the eyes tell no lies. So while in theater, we show you, if I'm mad, I'm mad. But on the lens, all you have to do is think it. Just think it, feel it in your body. And the camera's gonna pick it up. And the camera's gonna know if you're lying or not. And I, I like to think of the camera lens as my best friend, the thing that is always with me. You know, like, you know, we're in Atlanta with tons of reality shows. So imagine like reality show, there's always a camera around. So you get to a point where you stop paying attention to the camera. You right. just are being. And that was the biggest thing, but it took years of not looking and feeling really, honestly, very frustrated that like I'm talented. I made it to Broadway. You don't make it to Broadway by accident. Right. So what? It started, what's wrong with me? Do I not have it? And I was like, no, of course I got it. Right. Exactly. I'm God, this is God's gift. I need to adjust for the medium and just go to school and just study. And my school, when I say go to school, my school was just turning on my television and then emulating what I saw. Oh, I see. Oh, the way she walks, the way she turns. Oh, the way she sits, the way she stands. Ah, oh. and I started to study that. Take notes, take notes, take notes, take notes. And that's what changed my career. And that's the, stuff, the same stuff I know I was talking to you offline about what I teach other actors. Uh, it's a game. So yeah, it was tough in the beginning, but clearly I figured it out. You said something so important that Sydney Party said, and I was watching an interview with him, and he said it's about, because he said when he started, he was not the best actor. He was not good at all, and he booked a little job, but it was about the constant repeating and studying and trying to practice. He was always practicing. Whether he was on the station, he started out in theater as well. You know, always practicing, even off the stage. Mm -hmm. Just trying to really hard, watching people, mimicking them. So it's so funny that you actually have that same 
you know, feeling and imminent thought that he did, you know, so that just shows like greatness thinks alike and you are like on that level of becoming a legend. Oh, There's so yeah. many other legendary actors out there that comes in, you're like going into that era. That has to be an amazing thing. Yeah, it is. I'm, I, I can't even front, like I'm living the life that I dreamt as a child. Kids were like, you're little, like in kindergarten, and they say, What do you want to be when you grow up? And kids say, I want to be a firefighter, I want to be a, a teacher or astronaut. I was like, Singer, actor, dancer. <laughs> right? Uh, singer, actor, dancer, yeah. Right. And of course, I've been great at other things. You know, I was going to go to college for print journalism, like, I got accepted right. to Columbia University, but I just, the arts just pulled me. And, um, but yeah, I'm. I'm, I, I just, so I, I pinch myself sometimes and I just give gratitude and grace to God, yeah. you know, like I'm living the dream, the, the, what I started up here, you talk about, again, going back to vision boards, the vision in my mind is sitting here right now doing interviews, talking about what I love to do, like I play for a living, right. you know, right. so. So, um, during this interview, you have touched on several different times your struggle and working um, and just, you know, just really trying to make it but coming from a humble beginning mm -hmm. and habit, so oh, yeah. you got to work. Was there ever a time in your life, because this is the thing that most people don't tell you in Hollywood, right? Because you see them, you always see the glisten and glamour, oh, yeah. but you never oh, really please. know. Right that many of them be living in their cars and experience homelessness and things like that. Like, that's the story that they don't want to tell. But the reason why I want to touch on it is because it's realistic. It can happen to any of us, especially in today's day and age, Absolutely. with what is going on in our world. Was there ever a time where your struggle was so bad for you that you said, oh my gosh, I, I may be homeless. I may not have it. Like, this is too hard. Like, if I do this, I won't have this. Did you ever experience that? Well, not homelessness, but I will say this. There was, and I'm very trans, I'm, I'm, I'm an open book in my audience, in my community. I, even in my book, I talk about, I talk about that. Um, you know, I think it was like two, that it was, I told y'all the story. I left Mandalay Bay, Lion King clothes. I came to LA, stars in my eyes. Like, I'm ready to take Hollywood by storm. Hollywood was like, no man, you don't know what you're doing yet. Right? So I struggled. And then at that time, I had multiple properties. I bought my first house when I was 23. Then I bought my second one in 2008. Right? And then, you know, when I was on Broadway, I had to have another property because you work on Broadway, you have to have a place to live. You're not getting per diem and all that extra money. So it's like, now we're talking about three properties. Don't let no tenant 